Okay, thank you, Bill. Um, good evening, everyone. It is 6 p.m. and I call to order the C.J. Woolley City Council. Today is January 27th and I am Mayor Julia Johnson. Um, will you all please stand with me and say the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag, to the flag of, the of the United States, States of America. And to the Republic which stands one nation under and God. God indivisible with liberty and justice, and justice for, all. for all. Thank you, everyone. Um, I'll start off with roll call. Uh, I'll begin with the councilwomen, Councilwoman Joellen Kesty. Present. Thank you. Councilwoman Brenda Kinzer. Do you mind saying it for the record, Brenda? I'm sorry, I thought I was off mute. Um, present. Thank you, okay. Councilman Glenn Allen. Present. Thank you. Councilman Chuck Owen. Present. Thank you. Councilman Brendan McGoffin. Present. Councilman Kevin Loy. Present. And Councilman uh, Carl DeYoung. Present. Thank you. All right. All right, looking for approval of the agenda. Um, do I have a motion? Madam Mayor, I make a motion to approve the agenda. Thank you. Is there a second? Councilman Madam Owens. Mayor, I'll second it. Mm. All right. He beat you to it, Glenn. So we have a motion by okay. Councilman Kinsler, second by Councilman Owen. Any discussion? All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, aye. same sign. Okay, motion carries. Consent agenda, items one through three. Do I have a motion? Madam Mayor. Oh, go ahead. No, go ahead. <laughs> okay, uh, Madam Mayor, I make a motion to approve the consent agenda. Thank you. Is there a second? I second that. Thank you. So I had a motion by Councilman McGoffin, seconded by Councilwoman Kinzer. Any discussion? All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. All right. So, well, as you, if you were on just a few minutes ago, you heard that we have some special guests here tonight. We have um, Judge Jennifer Hausen, along with her assistant, Letty Noonins. Am I saying your name correct? Well, thank yes. you, Letty. And um, also here to answer questions after the presentation is Judge Brock Stiles. So uh, Jennifer, welcome, and um, I'll hand it over to you. All right, thank you. Well, first of all, just introduce myself a little bit briefly and say uh, I am a newly appointed judge at Skagit County District Court. And prior to that, for four years, I served as district uh, court commissioner. So I was a judicial officer presiding over court in the black robe, just the same. Uh, during that time, when I came onto the bench, prior to that, I was an attorney in Skagit County and a Skagit County business owner in downtown Mount Vernon for 25 years prior to going on the bench. And so when I went on the bench, the first thing I noticed right away was the revolving door in and out of the jail. And so I, I uh, noticed that that was just happening and we weren't making any progress. We weren't making a dent in the issue. And uh, I know Chief Tucker would uh, support having seen this over the years as well and Judge Stiles. And so what I, what I started doing was looking for some sort of solution to change the way courts take place. And it's really the first change we've seen in how courts operate in the last 200 years. So what it is, and I'll just do a brief overview and then I'll leave some time hopefully for some questions if you have any and a little bit for Ms. Nunez to share as well. But community court is a linking court. It's a services court. It's a helping court. And what it is that's so unique that's different is from the very first day 
of court, the defendant or the individual who's charged with a low level misdemeanor, such as uh, shoplifting, theft, paraphernalia charges, crimes of poverty, uh, crimes of mental illness and crimes of uh, addiction, homelessness, all of those kinds of things. So trespass, shoplifting and paraphernalia are the real common uh, community court charges. There are also the kind of charges that really burden uh, first responders and law enforcement. And so what we were looking for is a solution. So we studied around the nation in courts that were uh, trying to make a change in the way uh, these issues are addressed because there's no probation department to handle these kinds of issues. So what was happening is that people would not show up for their court dates, they'd get warrants, then they'd get a court date three months down the road, and then they'd warrant again, and there was never any really solution, and there was no looking at what the underlying issue was that gave rose, gave rise to those charges, the, the issues of homelessness, poverty, addiction, and mental illness, and so forth. So. What we designed uh, following models of very successful community courts uh, in other jurisdictions is a community court. So what happens that's different, as I mentioned, is we link the individual on their very first court date. So for example, the uh, police officer could cite someone that's sleeping without a home out in the street in, the bus in a business owner's lobby or you know front area with trespass. They'd come into the community court and on the first day, the judge would link them up with the uh, community action housing list, link them up with job so core, work source, uh, Apple care, uh, get them an evaluation for any drug addiction, get a mental health assessment if needed, really uh, ask some detailed questions and figure out what the underlying issue that gave rise to the crime. And then we try to solve it. And we try to solve it right there on the very first day of court by linking that individual to the provider. And that's what's unique about the courtroom. If any of you have been in a court before, you see usually the two opposing counsels and the defendants and their room full of people. They could spend all day in the courtroom waiting for their case to be heard, to have it be set over for many months. And so, but what we do in community court is the providers are right there in the room. So they go around the room with the provider and get their appointments and needs met. Like they'll get an appointment for an assessment. They'll get hooked up with a mental health provider. They could get signed up for Apple Care uh, so that then they can get treatment and all of those kinds of things. So what, what traditionally community courts have seen in the successful courts across the country is that the recidivism rate, the repeat offenses are reduced and the impact on law enforcement is reduced as well as the impact on first responders. So that's what we're designing and would like to bring to Cedro Woolley. And we are already up and going and have been up and going in Skagit County District Court, Anacortes Municipal Court and Mount Vernon Municipal Court for several months. And of course the pandemic has hit us hard, uh, but we are, we are still holding court in each of those courts and have at least 10 to 15 people who we are serving each week. Ms. Nunez is here. She is our community court development coordinator. And she comes from a background of working in the probation department. And I, I'm just going to estimate, I believe it's like 13 years of experience working yes, with probation. Okay. And so she, we also have a case manager that we've hired who comes from a background of services in the jail. So she worked for the Skagit County Sheriff's Office in the jail. So all of us as a team have seen over the years that what the current system is not working, right? So uh, together as a team, we're bringing the, our, our team to the court and uh, seeking change. And we've, we've had such tremendous support from the mayors of each city and Mayor Johnson, we appreciate you having us here. And uh, we would really, we really look forward to launching a community court model here in Cedro Woolley. And so Ms. Nunez, did you want to, uh, say a few words about anything else that you want to provide to this group. Yeah, I think you you covered it pretty well, Judge Housen. Um, I, you know, just the the flow of the courtroom, you know, is exactly how, how you mentioned it. You know, we have our case manager who will assess the, the each client and figure out what their needs are. And then we'll be able to link them up with the provider right there in the room. So 
it's uh, we've received a lot of a lot of support. Um, we have our providers um, for each each individual court, um, whether it be a, a treatment provider or work source community action, and we are working on adding more providers as we go and and being able to create something to make a change within each community. And what about the grants that you have? Can you briefly summarize? I know it's really detailed what the grants are, but uh, what are some of the grants cover that we have for funding? So currently we are working with a True Blood grant um, and we also have a CJTA grant um, through public health. Um, both of those are through public health. And then we have our federal grant. So each of those, I think True Blood has um, some funds available for us to help provide services to, to the clients. So there is a budget in there for uh, recovery services. And in our federal grant, we also have um, made a budget for, for um, recovery services. So we've been sure to be able to uh, have funds set aside for those clients who really need that help and we, you know, we can support them get through all of their struggles. And, and what are some of the other forms of accountability that the individuals that go through community court provide? What are some of the other recommendations that the needs and risk assessment shows the court that we need to put in their agreements? So we are currently, um, we are being sure to um, screen them carefully and of course, you know, really target the uh, ones who have the substance abuse issues. Um, veterans are a big um, priority. Um, we are looking to get a little bit more creative. Um, so we have for accountability, like for the thefts uh, and whatnot, we have letters of apology. Um, we have them where we've been looking up classes uh, that they can take online currently right now with COVID, post COVID, we hope to come up with some different things. Um, but just really some insight on helping them um, reflect on their actions and how they can change. Um, we've also asked them to write letters as far as what their experience has been going through our, our community court. Um, I, we've had, since I've been um, the coordinator with community court, I think I've seen about six graduations, um, people who have successfully completed their, the, the community court program. And I like to step aside with them and ask them, you know, what is, what is your experience? What do you think we, we've accomplished? What, what have you felt that you've accomplished? And what, what are some things that we can work on? So I really ask them what their feedback is. Um, currently, right now, we have about 54 active clients in uh, all three com working community courts, and we're about to start uh, Burlington Municipal Court, and we already have, as far as I know, um, some full calendars coming up. So everybody's on board, and we're excited to, to work with each individual municipal court and get things rolling and hopefully make a big difference. And the, and the only other small, there's lots, I, I could go on for hours, but I won't. I wanna leave time in case anyone has any questions for myself or for Judge Stiles. But one unique, another factor of community court that involves Chief Tucker and uh, the law enforcement is, is that we're working on a program for what's called direct sighting. And that's where law enforcement, who's, who's hands-on on the street, knows the people, they know, the, they know these, uh, customers, clients, what, what, what have you, uh, they, and they're familiar. And so they can, uh, we, we would like to start a program where they can directly cite that individual to community court. And that has a lot of benefits. Also in their database, it reflects for law enforcement that the person is in a community court anywhere in one of the five community courts across the county. The reason we have a united team like this that, that other than Judge Stiles, uh, will be presiding over any uh, community court in Cedro Woolley, the rest of the team will travel and they, we have a, a database and a system that links very well uh, and traditionally well with the database that law enforcement uses. So we can communicate about these individuals. So th uh, uh, that's another huge difference. Did you wanna say anything Judge Stiles or does anyone have any questions for us? Why don't we start with Judge Stiles? Do you have anything that you would like to? Well, just to add, I mean, they did a fantastic job of explaining the, um, the community court uh, concept. Uh, 
what I want to emphasize is that we're, I mean, these are uh, individuals that are going to be defendants within the, the uh, court system anyway in Cedar Woolley. And so we're, we're going to be utilizing the existing uh, staff. So myself, uh, Bill McCann, uh, Pete Gilbert will still be the, the prosecutor and the uh, public defender. So there's no additional expense with uh, with those staff members because it's it's cases we would be handling anyway under the regular court system. And so I think that fits really well with um, what we have over here in Seagull Woolley. And so I think we're going to start our first community court on February the 18th. So it'll be uh, the third Thursday of uh, each month. Uh, it'll be tacked on at the end of the regular court system. So we're, uh, our court calendar around two o'clock or 2.30 in the afternoon and we'll run for about an hour or whatever it takes to be able to uh, get everybody uh, through the system. So, I mean, there's, there's due process uh, things in place as far as everybody's gonna have the access to the public defender if they need it before they decide whether they go into the program or not. So it's not, uh, it's, so it's somewhat of a voluntary program, but it's, I think it's gonna be a real benefit to a lot of people because they, a lot of, uh, unfortunately, some of the people that come into court, uh, one, like Judge Housen says, they, they don't appear in the first place. Uh, but when they do get there, it'll have some places where they can really get some help and hopefully get them out of this uh, cycle that they might be in. So uh, really excited for this to start. We started up court again last week, uh, all by Zoom and surprisingly, uh, I think we almost had a better turnout than we normally have uh, in person. So it may be something we do uh, a little bit off and on uh, here on out for a while. But um, yeah, it's uh, we had <laughs> we had people in their cars. We had people driving in their cars, showing up on Zoom. We had them in there where they were working. We uh, so it actually worked out well. And so we're going to do the same program with uh, with the community court for as long as we. Um, we have to. So again, very, very happy that uh, uh, Judge Housen kind of spearheaded this uh, program and we'll see, uh, I think we'll see some good benefits over in Cedar Woolley here. And I would just add two things and then we can answer those questions. I see the hands up. Uh, Catholic Community Services has, and every single provider that we have across the county in all five uh, community courts is uh, not charging, they're not charging contracts, they're not charging anybody any money. They are, do, they are doing this because they believe in it as well and they are getting their clients that they would not otherwise get. So a person gets signed up for Apple Care and they're paid out of that or their other funding sources or out of our grant. So th there's no cost for these providers either so far to date. So. Very good, thank you. Yeah, I see a couple of hands too. Uh, Councilman DeYoung. Hi, thank you. This is just such great news uh, to hear about uh, these new systems. I'm really excited to get it happen. And uh, I'm familiar with uh, a court, mental health court, veterans court areas, and looking to see how uh, the program uh, moves on here at Skagit County. I, I have a few questions. Mainly, right, than the traditional courtroom, and it's a little more informal. Ancient. And I was wondering what kind of training uh, goes uh, with our police officers who, um, you know, this is going to be a different uh, and unfamiliar court setup for them. And also in the community, how are we, uh, what's the liaison between community groups uh, working side by side with some of these folks to kind of let them know what's impacting in their community. And, and when they're out in the community doing the work of community service, how there can be a better connection there. Thank you. I think if I'm understanding your, what your question is, is that yes, part of what part of what we do in community court is outreach in the community. And uh, almost every week I'm meeting with somebody, our next meeting is with Helping Hands because they have a similar kind of uh, program. And so I've been speaking with Rebecca there. And uh, um, so it, reaching out to the community is important and that's part of why what we're doing tonight and in and each week uh, as we develop the community partners I would encourage all of you once COVID is over to come by and and watch community court in session also since it is so different uh, and 
that's always encouraging as well. So did I yeah, answer my first, my first, Yeah, second part, great. First question is what kind of uh, uh, training is going on? So when the police officers arrive into court, uh, it's a little different situation than formal court, right? So right. Uh, right. what kind of uh, interchange, interconnection is happening there? Well, the first thing you notice in community court, and I'm not sure if Judge Stiles is going to follow this model or not, but but we as judges take our robes off and uh, sit down at a table at the same level with the individual so that we can ask them questions like about how did you get in this mess? How did, what led to this? What kind of behavior? And then you'll see me walk around and talk to the different providers and um, talk to the different uh, participants and just say, how was your week and all that. So I think law enforcement sees that uh, right off as a difference and so you, that, that's the energy I'm trying to create. And when the lawyers start turning, falling into their lawyer roles, I'm always reminding them. But, the, but I do mean it, uh, law enforcement really has, they're already, they already know this stuff. They know, they really know their job in the, on the street. And they know the people that it, this isn't gonna work for. And so they are not gonna recommend this person for community court because they're just mean or, you know, they're not, they're not gonna benefit. But they also know the people that are repeatedly offending because they just don't have the resources. And so when they know those people, I, I think they understand and I think they can tailor their behavior in court and the, their, the way they present. Yeah. Uh, Councilwoman Kinzer. <clears throat> yes, hello, Judge Housen and hello. Ms. Nunez. Um, I just want to let you know that with my career being in addiction and mental health, I really appreciate hearing this, that this is going on. And um, I think one of the biggest things that will help the folks involved in this community court is long-term follow-up with case managers and um, I, I really think that is crucial in making sure that these people can be successful in their lives because it's not just a six month thing or one year thing, it's many, many years worth of follow up. And I hope, I, I, I'm sure you do, but I really hope we have a plan in place to manage that long term follow up. And that is a huge difference between how it works right now on a trespass or a shoplift or a paraphernalia charge. There's often, uh, very limited jail time that can be imposed on that and very no supervision whatsoever. So any supervision that we give and any resources is a vast improvement. And whenever anybody has been assessed that needs treatment or mental health counseling or both, then we usually range between six months and a year of supervision. I'm fully aware that a lot of individuals need more, uh, but, but we, we do the best we can. But I agree with yep. you, it's so needed. It's very appreciated. Thank you. And I would just also say if any of you know of any other providers or services in the community, you could refer us to us, them to us and Ms. Nunez or myself at the um, Skagit County District Court. And uh, because we do a lot, we give bonus services, if you will. If somebody's actively trying to work on their addiction or mental health issues, we do a licensing clinic where we help them get their um, matters out of collection and get their license and insurance, get them ID in the first place. Um, there's anything ranges from dental work to teeth work to, um, you know, just anything we can dream up creative that a person might need. They might need eyeglasses, they might need a phone, they might need a uh, better Wi-Fi service, they might need a bus pass, those kinds of things. So if you, if any of you think of different service providers in your community that would like to participate in as, as well, just let us know. Thank you. It sounds like you have a wonderful um, support system set up. Thank you. Yeah, I think it's a great program, uh, excellent program. I'm excited about it. And I'm um, very happy that we are bringing it here to Cedar Woolley. Yes. So it, it'll be good. Um, I do, I do, I guess, um, have one request. I know that um, Judge Housen, you had mentioned the statistics in, um, I believe it's in Spokane and the success that they have had there. Can you speak to that a little bit? Because that's very encouraging to hear. So I don't have any of the raw numbers with me. I'm, do you have those, Ms. Nunez? Or I can give them to Mayor Johnson at a later time. But if you have any of those, 
I can, I have, and you may have Ms. Nunez also just from so far what we, what we've had in our community. Um, all I can tell you is there is some recidivism, recidivism rate always. Not everyone uh, flies right after this kind of intervention, but, um, and so I don't have the, the numbers right in front of me, but I could send them to you unless you have any, Ms. Nunez. No, I don't have any at the moment. Um, I just, I had pulled the, our numbers that we have here with, with our court, current courts um, that we have in session, but yeah, absolutely. I, I would, um, I'll look those up and uh, forward those. And would you, would you like to hear the ones from our three courts so far? Yeah. And, and the yeah. only thing is we don't, we will track all of these people to see, because our goal is to have much lower uh, cost on law enforcement and, and first responders. And that means they're not charged again. So every three to six to nine months, we'll be checking people to see if they have new charges. But we, so we're so early in our infancy and in our development, we aren't at that point yet. But Ms. Nunez, go ahead and share how many people we have and how many graduations and that kind of thing. How many people have received treatment if you have that? So um, currently, like I had mentioned, we have 54 active clients um, enrolled. Last year alone, we had a total of 60 um, for all of the community courts. And then um, this year, we've enrolled already eight. That was last updated a couple of weeks ago. So we still need to uh, get our files uh, inserted. So I think we've been able to welcome in about another five to six clients. And then uh, just in this past week, I believe we graduated about four additional, additional clients, uh, participants within the program. So we've, I, I, in my opinion, I would say we've had a pretty good uh, result. Um, our particip participants seem very happy. They're very open and receptive. Um, I was preparing my calendar for tomorrow for Anacortes Municipal this afternoon, and I was reaching out to a couple of clients, and um, they, they're just loving the, the attention when we reach out and, hey, you know, just a reminder, you have community court tomorrow. You know, did you, did you get this turned in? I didn't see it, you know, and you know, just the openness. I had one person worried that he hadn't completed his community service work yet. Um, but, you know, he's, am I going to go to jail? Am I going to be revoked? Am I going to be put back on the criminal calendar? No, 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 no. I said, no worries. I said, you know, report to court, appear via Zoom and we'll work with you. I said, that's what, that's what this is all about. And he was, he was over the moon. He was just excited and thank you, you know, very, very appreciative and in, in indicating that he had had already a, a very positive, um, experience with a community court so far so do you have any teachers, how many how many people have you referred for treatment for either drug or alcohol treatment or mental health treatment so i don't have those numbers um we haven't been able to set those up quite yet um that's something that i am working on with my with my excel spreadsheet getting all those numbers from all the files that we had had um, the paper files. So I'm, I'm getting those numbers and I would be able to provide the, that at a later date. Yeah. So yes, we're, right. we're, we're transferring from an, uh, paper files to online files. And also Ms. Nunez is replacing somebody else who was in the role previously. So she's only been with us for a short while and then COVID too. So yeah. And, and then we're welcoming on our, so at the same time that our case manager came on, I came on a couple weeks later. So we're all getting up to date. We're all organizing everything and, and trying to make everything as, as organized and, and readily available as possible. Thank you. Well, it's all very exciting. Again, I wanna thank you for coming. Thank you, Judge Housen. Thank you, Ms. Nunez. And thank you, Judge Stiles. And uh, we'll look forward to hearing about the success because we know that we will. Thank you. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Um, also on the list, we had um, the possible future code amendment, but you'll all remember that we did cover that um, at our last council meeting. So we will move on to staff reports and I will begin with, it looks like um, Assistant Chief Frank Wagner. I don't see the chief here, so I'm gonna go with you, Frank. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Uh, thanks for having me. I just wanted to give you an update uh, with uh, COVID vaccinations. Uh, we had uh, our second round for our staff uh, today. Uh, they graciously allowed us to uh, do that over at Mount Vernon uh, Fire Station 2. One of their uh, staff members is a, a registered nurse, a public health 
set that up for us. So we didn't go to the fairgrounds, but of the 47 folks that we have uh, on staff here between our volunteers, part-timers and career, uh, 20 uh, uh, plus, 20, well, 22 of our folks got vaccinated here uh, last month. Uh, some of the others uh, uh, since then have gotten vaccinated either in Whatcom County at other jobs or uh, over at their fairgrounds as well. So we're up to 26 folks uh, are in the process and uh, 22 of those finished up the second round today. Uh, we're monitoring uh, everyone because the word is that some of the uh, after uh, effects from the second dose are a little worse with some chills and some spiking of fevers, but so far uh, so good. No uh, reports of any of that yet, but it's we're only about uh, uh, eight hours since our second dose. Um, along with that, I uh, want to congratulate three of our uh, volunteers uh, uh, that have just recently been promoted to lieutenant. As you know, we have uh, we rely heavily upon the volunteers, the part timers, and the career as kind of a hybrid program here. And uh, Troy Hansen, who's been with us for uh, uh, 12 or 13 years. Aaron Bontrager and Michael Mejia have all been promoted and got through our training program. So they started January 1 as battalion officers uh, responding as lieutenants uh, on our uh, evening and weekend uh, uh, supervisor program that we have here. And a testament to Chief Klinger in the department and our training uh, staff here over the years. We have uh, another uh, vacancy uh, happening over here in the residence uh, quarters where the guys and gals come in and live here in the in-house and uh, get the training and, and experiences to move on to bigger uh, career departments. Dalton Osborne's last shift was yesterday. He uh, got uh, picked up by South County Fire in Everett as a career uh, uh, firefighter. So he was here with us just a little over a year, year and a half. Uh, great, great uh, addition to their department, a big loss to us. But the third uh, one that South County has pulled from us in the last six months, and they continue to call and say, uh, be our pipeline, keep them coming, because uh, good quality folks. Um, other than that, I don't have anything to report. We're still in phase one with COVID, as you all know, uh, hoping with the new regional uh, uh, roadmap to recovery that will move eventually into phase two. Um, it's all reliant, of course, upon the numbers between us, San Juan Island and Whatcom County. Um, with uh, that, PPE continues to be an issue for all of us as far as the procurement and the increased cost. Uh, mm -hmm. For example, a year ago, uh, we were paying between $6.50 and $7.50 for a box of uh, gloves that we use on every single call. Now we're seeing some of those prices uh, upwards of $18 to $20 for the same exact product. Um, and the allocations, if you haven't been purchasing those over the past year, some of the suppliers are limiting the amount you can purchase when and if they are available, even with those increased prices. So we're staying up on the game, trying to uh, keep supplied as we can get allocations. And uh, so far, we've done a really good job with uh, 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 working in collaboration with our local uh, uh, EMS, DEM, and uh, we started the uh, collective uh, purchasing deal with uh, Burlington, Mount Vernon, Anacortes and ourselves to help us in our surrounding districts with the N95s, the gowns, the gloves and that stuff. So we've been able to stay ahead of the game, but we're not out of the woods yet. And uh, that's, that's all I have at this time, unless there's any questions. Okay, I don't see any. Thank you, Frank. Great report. Um, I might add to that. You were talking about the vaccines. Um, Earlier today, we heard that um, that the test site is open. So um, the test site is open third, uh, Tuesdays, Fridays, and Saturdays now. They've changed it. It's Tuesdays, uh, Fridays, Saturdays from 10 to 4. But they do have the vaccine clinic that will be open. It'll be Tuesday through Saturdays, 7.30 AM to 6 PM. Uh, they were saying that we are in 1B, so anybody 65 and older can, um, they're eligible for the shot. You can schedule online or you can call and make an appointment. They've added six more call takers. They were really, they were inundated um, with calls. Uh, there's many, many people who really want, want to participate in this. So far, they've given out um, over 7,600 doses of vaccine. 
and uh, 5.85% 5. uh, 5, 5. of the county population has initiated vaccines. So 5.85%. So, um, so we're on our way. Okay, thank you, Frank. Um, I will move on to uh, Chief Tucker. Got it, thank you, Mayor. Um, I guess to continue on with what uh, uh, Frank was saying, um, we've had our folks in for uh, uh, vaccination as well. We've got, we had three days to get our first round of shots and we're two thirds of the way through the department. We had one officer had a really bad reaction, was down for about three days after that. Um, there is a positive side to that. Um, she's one of our youngest officers and she kind of looked at me and said, well, you know, it's the, it seems to be the younger officers uh, seem to be the ones that are getting hit the hardest with, uh, you know, these illnesses. And then she looked at me as I was saying, I had no effect from the vaccine. And then I realized that she's considerably younger than my youngest child. So I said, we'll just kind of leave it at that. But um, we've gotten most, or we've got, like I said, two thirds of our people through and uh, not really looking through the second round because we are hearing those reports of potentials for um, some downtime on that. But um, I think it's beneficial to just keep pushing forward. Um, so we're looking forward to getting that and we're looking at mid to the last half of February to get um, that second round of vaccinations. Um, some of you may have seen some of our social media traffic. Um, we had a car versus apartment building uh, wreck about a week ago and uh, the apartment building won, but it took a beating. Um, the car came up, uh, Rita Street by uh, Eni Lumber, hit the side of the new downtown 48 building, uh, clipped a power pole, took out power, and took out a corner of uh, one of the apartments, probably woke the residents there, ripped the front right tire off the car, and apparently you don't need four tires to continue through town because we've got some excellent footage of the car three-wheeling its way through the downtown area before we finally caught up with it, uh, oh, probably six or eight blocks away. Um, Nathan, I think, took a look at the street and there's a scratch mark from the um, where the car crashed to where it kind of come in for a landing. And the, the tire and the front, all the suspension was still left behind. It was one of the crazier accidents that I've, um, I've seen. Um, and oddly enough, the driver had been drinking just a lot. So um, it was uh, it was kind of an interesting night that Friday night, and, and it was a big hit on social media when we posted the pictures. Uh, Nathan's uh, got some excellent cameras down there on the clock tower, and it picks up a lot of weird stuff going on at night. So we got a car driving through with a spray of sparks coming out of it. Um, give you an update on uh, trainees. We've still got four people in training um, with their training officers here at the department. They're all doing really well. Um, I like to poke fun at the noobs, but um, they're really wonderful people. Um, they're doing really well. We have one that just graduated yesterday. We'll be cycling him into the training rotation um, here uh, next, or by the end of the week, I think, or early next week. I've got one more starting tomorrow. Um, when we hired Katie Wilson back, she was out for some medical things uh, during most of January. But uh, she's a seasoned officer, and we're getting her back and putting her on the road uh, starting tomorrow. And we're in the process of hiring two more. So if you start doing the math on that, um, if we have 20 officers in our department, we're going to have 10 or 11 new people by the end of this year. Um, and they're going to be out committing law enforcement upon the public left and right, I'm thinking. And uh, we're looking forward to getting them out on the street. And even had a little more good news. It's good news for me, maybe not so much for Doug in the finance department. We got our two of our new cars came in about six to eight months early. This is unheard of. We weren't expecting them. We hadn't ordered any parts for them. We were hoping they would be in by September. They came in in January. So we got enough cars to put everybody in cars. And uh, now we just got to get the parts to get them in there and get everybody trained up. So we're really looking forward to that. And the last thing I have um, is from uh, uh, most of my family lives in Kansas City, so I got to say go Chiefs. And that's all I have. 
All right. Thank you, Chief. Uh, we'll move on to uh, Director of Building, John Coleman. Good evening, Mayor, Council. Thank you. Um, just to want to give an update on what the Planning Commission has been working on. They started in January a discussion of uh, electronic reader boards in the Central Business District and had a, a good discussion about um, potential ways to make changes and, uh, and improve the regulations for that. Um, and so they'll be continuing their discussion on that issue in February and um, we'll probably won't we'll see something at the council for uh, a couple more months. Uh, the Planning Commission also started work on review of our shoreline master program. Uh, that was just a initial getting in touch with what the what updates needed to be done and what the shoreline master program is. And we'll be bringing uh, some uh, more information for them with public hearings also in February. Um, we received a grant from the Department of Ecology to update the Shoreline Master Program, and that is due in the end of June. So uh, we'll have the Planning Commission review that. This is a, a update. We were last, uh, last did a major overhaul of the Shoreline Master Program in 2016, so we're not expecting major overhaul. We're just expecting some review and, and minor tweaks. Um, the, uh, if you recall at the last city council meeting, the city council approved uh, the 2018 international uh, codes to go into effect as required by the state. Um, as part of that, so since we're changing over from the 2015 codes to the 2018 codes on February 1st. We're all on target to do that. Um, oh, we, we get a big push from the development community uh, when this happens. Everybody wants to get their applications in before the new rules come into effect. So we've seen a major flood of applications in the planning and building department. Um, so we'll, uh, take a little longer to review some of the things that uh, normally get out quickly, but just because uh, there's a lot coming in, including um, many single family homes at the, the uh, two locations where uh, the, at Cambridge Commons and uh, over there at Cook and Trail, as well as a, a large uh, apartment, a commercial and apartment building uh, and a 24 unit apartment building in the in another area. So lots going on in the building and planning department. And then of course, we'll be having a public hearing in a little later in this meeting. So I will stop speaking for now and talk to you again briefly in a moment. All right, thank you, John. Uh, Director of Public Works, Mark Freiberger. Thank you, Mayor. Good evening, Council. Um, we've been pretty busy here in, in public works and engineering with uh, design projects. Um, mainly, uh, we're getting fairly close to 100% plans on the uh, SR20, SR9 intersection project. Uh, we hope to have that out to advertisement in April and build that later this summer. Uh, we've also begun designing our Wicker Road overlay project. Uh, we are including some ADA upgrades at the state and township intersection there. Some of you might be interested in that as a part of that project. And uh, I'll, I'll leave it at that. I've got a lot of uh, presentations myself to make later tonight, so I'll reserve that time for later. Thank you, Mayor. All right. Thank you, Mark. Um, financial Manager Jill Scott. Thank you, Mayor. Good morning. Uh, good, uh, good evening, Council. Um, we've been very busy in finance. This is a really busy time, end of year um, reporting and uh, lots of mandatory reports that we're getting out the door. Um, continuing to work with our new finance um, accounts payable clerk, Trina. She's been working out great. Um, and uh, we were supposed to go live tonight on our web-based uh, financial software, but that is delayed until next week. So we're looking uh, forward to that. 
Um, Christine has been working with um, Glenn and Bill to look at some new cemetery software and um, just lots of response to various department requests. And that's it. All right, thank you, Jill. Um, City Attorney Nikki Thompson. Good afternoon or evening. Um, I don't have much to add um, since planning and public works has been fairly busy. That means that Nikki has been fairly busy as well. So nothing to add and I will speak with you soon about a proposed code change. Thank you, Nikki. Um, City Supervisor Doug Merriman. All right, good evening, Mayor and Council. On my information tonight, uh, under people, uh, we had an opening for a utility worker in public works, an operations two position. Uh, we did uh, look at filling that position and congratulations internally to Tucker Johnson, who's gonna do a lateral move from the wastewater treatment plant to that position. Uh, we'll be working on the timing of that with Kevin and Nathan uh, to make sure we're still covered at the treatment plant till we get that position filled. But we will have an opening at the treatment plant for a specialist position. Uh, the finance director position, we've been working steadily on this one. We've completed three different rounds of interviews and have narrowed the field down we, uh, this last week to two individuals. Uh, we had a second round with them and then the mayor and I uh, also had some phone calls uh, to get this down. Uh, the next steps we'll be doing is looking at doing the background checks on our candidates and uh, finding out what information we can there. And then the mayor uh, talked to me this morning a little bit as well about seeing if we could possibly bring a candidate here for a visit. Uh, we have, uh, of our top two, we have one candidate from the Whatcom County area and the other candidate is from California. So we would have to, we have some logistics put together there to bring them up here. Uh, even in Zoom, uh, it's not quite the same when you get to meet somebody and get a feel for their personality and their thoughts and things on what would be good for Cedar Woolley. So we'll keep you appraised of how we're moving forward on that. Uh, one of the projects, if you look over my right shoulder, uh, on my whiteboard there, I am putting together my work list for 2021. Uh, part of this is wish, wishful thinking, but hopefully we'll get it done. And other are some things that the mayor and I have been talking about for a few months, and we've already started on some of those. Uh, one of those is looking at our personnel policy manual. And this is a policy manual that includes different elements that are like human resource type topics, as far as hiring and working conditions, vacation, those types of things. Uh, when I checked that last version, uh, our most recent one is actually from 1990. So there've been a few things have changed out there in the HR world, probably in the last 30 years. So Nikki's taken a good look at that and we're gonna be looking at uh, redoing that manual and getting it up to date to today's standards. So that'll be a pretty big project and will involve the department heads and some other staff as well. So moving on to land, we have a couple different things going on. One is the Reed Street property uh, next to the park. Uh, we're moving forward on that. I weekly talk with the owners, in particular, Jill Rao. Uh, we've been working through the appraisal process. Uh, this time right now, getting appraisers uh, in quickly is a challenge so much because they're pretty busy. But we're thinking that we'll probably have the appraisal part done maybe in about two to three weeks and all the numbers and everything put together. Uh, the Rao's are, they said they're not in a hurry. They wanna work with the city, so we're good there. Uh, they've been really nice to work with. So as soon as we find that out, we'll start the price negotiations with them and I'll have more information for you, but I at least wanted to give everybody an update on that. Uh, one other piece of property we've been working on, we've talked about it a couple of times, is the Skagit PUD property or where the ball fields are. And it's been an interesting process going through here. Uh, we were getting ready to close on that property. And then finally, um, George Sidhu from Skagit PUD, the director there said, oh, you know what? We have some water lines in that property that actually belong to Skagit PUD that aren't in an easement because they own the property. So 
we have no, Nikki's going to be drawing up some uh, easements, working with them on that. And we'll have those addendums to the closing. So we were almost there, but not quite yet. So we have a little bit more paperwork to do and we'll have that one closed. Uh, other pieces of property, we have the library. If you've been driving by, it's looking like a library and it's really looking nice and getting finished up. We're at the point right now where we're steadily working the closing. Uh, sometimes those final punch lists, it seems like the last 10% takes 90% of your time. You know, uh, so particularly in the electrical area, we're getting those things finished up and hopefully, hopefully we'll be getting uh, that project wrap up and substantial completion here with, I'm hoping in the next couple of weeks. We'll still have the library moving their items in there. They've already started on shelving and some of their equipment and things. Uh, so it'll still be a little bit of time, you know, getting through February before we get the building open. But we're moving along. It's just uh, slowly but surely right now. And then finally, moving to the money area, as Jill mentioned, we're looking at closing up uh, 2000 that year and getting the books closed. Uh, we'll be really interested in seeing what the final impact of COVID was on our budget. Uh, if you remember last March, we had a pretty dreary outlook, um, but some odd things happened with how people buy things and how sales tax went. For the most part, I think we'll be okay. We did lose quite a bit of rental income from having our facilities closed, like our senior center and community center and some of our uh, parks. So um, we'll get a report to you on that. We have some, it takes us a little while to get closed because the law says we have to leave certain things open for a period of time. But we'll get that information to you as soon as we can. And then a couple of just last things. Uh, we have the new 2021 uh, committee assignments. So I'll be reaching out to the finance committee here uh, probably in the next week or so to see about getting everybody together and actually uh, start working on some finance topics and things there. So if you're on that committee, uh, you'll be hearing from me soon. And the last item is agendas. And this is a program we're gonna be moving to. Uh, you did hear uh, Jill talk about some different programs and things like our cemetery software. We're really looking at upgrading our technology to include agendas, which is a city council agenda packet preparation software. And we've already been through uh, the creation of the documents with the company, everything. We'll be rolling that out here fairly soon. We have some staff training to go through and we're looking for some really good efficiencies and helping out Christine on the paper flow. Right now, uh, she chases a lot of paper around to get that packet together. And hopefully this will be a good approval process and a good way to get that information out. So that's what I have for my report tonight. Very good, thank you, Doug. Um, we will move on to council reports and I will begin with um, Joelle and Kesty. I don't have anything at this time, thank you. Thank you. And Councilwoman Brenda Kinzer. Yes, hi, um, good evening. I am hearing uh, uh, little blurbs about cemetery software and I'm wondering and hoping that the Northern State Hospital Cemetery will be included on that. And I'd sure like to help if it will be included on that because I have a lot of documentation as I'm sure the city also does, but um, that's a really big deal to a lot of people. So I am hoping we can include that on some sort of um, software site that the city will be handling. And also um, I just wanna report that I have received my second COVID vaccine also. I'm very happy to have received that. And I hope that side effects that people receive do not deter others from receiving the vaccine. Um, it's very short-lived. I myself am one of the very small percentage that had serious side effects, but I'm way better now. I know I wasn't sick. It was just side effects of my body preparing itself to um, fight off the COVID virus. So um, hopefully people don't let the stories about the side effects that they hear deter them from getting the vaccine. It's very, very important and it's very short-lived. We can all just suck it up for a day and deal with it. 
and be thankful that we have been able to receive the vaccine. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Brenda. Um, Councilman Glenn Allen. Looks like he's missing in action here. <laughs> Councilman Glenn Allen, nothing to report? <laughs> you're, you're muted, you're muted, Glenn. I there did have some effects from my first COVID. Uh, Mike Anderson told me I'd grow horns and I did, but Anyway, I'm sorry, Brenda had bad. I, I had a sore arm for like two days and I can't wait until I get my second dose and I hope the rest of our town, uh, I, I would advise it. I don't want to give it to my kids and grandkids and I don't want to get it from my kids and grandkids. So anyway, I'm all for the inoculations. So anyway, that's my story, okay? Thank you, Glenn. Uh, Councilman Chuck Owen. Thank you, Mayor. I don't have much. I just want to thank the judge for her presentation, you know, on the community court. I think it's going to be a, a real benefit to the city of Cedro Wood. And that, that's all I have. All right. Thank you, Chuck. Councilman Brendan McGoffin. Hi, thank you. I have uh, no report tonight. All right, thank you, Brendan. Councilman Kevin Loy. Greetings, everybody. Um, I also had my first COVID shot and unlike Brenda, an hour later, I didn't even know I had it, no soreness in arms or anything. So I virtually have no symptoms from that. And far as getting along with the council here, I'm getting up to speed. I'm trying to, this is my first time around with computers instead of paper. So I got a laptop here trying to follow the agenda and trying to figure out how to work this thing but it's going to i think it's going to work quite well once i figure it out all right thank you kevin uh councilman carl de young carl you carl you're muted thank you no Oh, I should speak then. <laughs> uh, uh, poor humor. Uh, uh, a lot of chippers and, and uh, chainsaws going uh, went on around the neighborhood from the big windstorm we had. And uh, it's good to see um, some dangerous trees come down on uh, township and state. Uh, good to see that uh, the problem resolved. Um, I did uh, have a question about the library. How many uh, charging stations did we plan for there? Uh, for electric vehicles that was asked to me by a neighbor. I don't, Doug, do you, I don't recall. Do you? I don't recall that we put any in, did we? Well, it looks like, um, I, I, I guess, Doug, you're muted. Or maybe he has stepped away. So we can get that answer for you, though, Carl. We can do okay, that. Okay, great. And then just following up from two weeks ago where we're um, headed on a constituent request on looking at Township and Jameson with uh, making that stop sign a little more visible. Are there any reports on emphasis poles or where we're headed on engineering uh, with, that, uh, with that intersection? Just following hey, up on that. Hello, Hello Carl. Mark. Yeah, hi. I, um, We've been pretty much um, pedal to the metal on a couple of other matters the last two weeks. So we haven't pursued that very far, but we will look at that. Thank you very much. That ends my report. Uh, Mayor Johnson. Yes. Uh, my, my apologies. Uh, my Zoom was spinning on my screen and I couldn't get in. But oh. um, So to answer Mr. DeYoung's question, I'll have to find out for you. I know there were some provisions being made for that. 
but I'll get that information and get it right back to you. Thanks, Doug. Perfect, thank you. Okay, so um, I just have a couple of things following up with the library. So I was actually in a meeting today with, um, with Jean Williams and she was talking about that they're looking to move the collection the week of February 16th. That's what they're hoping to do. Uh, they're still waiting on the fiber to get it. The fiber is to the building. It is not in the building yet. They're waiting for all that to be um, set up. So that, that's important. That's a huge issue. They need to do that. And uh, they um, are also looking, one of the things that Jean says that she would really like to do is partner with some of the different agencies here in the Skagit Valley, work with them uh, as they can with the library. And uh, the meeting that I was in today was in with um, Macklin uh, Hamilton of <clears throat> Job Corps. And, uh, and so they're talking about um, possibly some of their students coming in and, and helping some of the, um, some of the uh, library clientele with getting basic needs met or learning how to do uh, basic things with their computers. So um, I'm sure that they'll talk more about that. There may be more that'll be developed out of that, but um, Jean is really extraordinary. She's got a lot of plans and visions for the for the library. And I, I just think it's gonna be um, a wonderful thing when we get it up and going. The question was asked, when, it, when are they gonna open their doors? And really it's like, all the rest of us, it depends upon what happens with the governor, what he does. Phase one, it's curbside service uh, for the library. Phase two, it'll be 25% uh, capacity. So um, that, that, that'll be the progression. All right, um, and then I think um, just a reminder for those of you who have not heard, uh, City Scene Magazine has uh, gone electronic. Um, the Phillips Publishing, uh, agency had to close the doors. COVID took its toll on a lot of businesses and they were one of them. So we are moving um, online and you can actually go to our website and sign up for the magazine and put your email in and it will be delivered to you um, every quarter. So you'll have a chance to, uh, to um, check it out. Um, one last thing, I saw where Nathan was on the line here and Nathan, I didn't know if you wanted to give a brief, a a, a very, very brief um, uh, description of what's happening at the uh, community center right now. Oh, sure. So um, working with the Rotary Club, we're uh, basically going in and doing a cosmetic upgrade to the restrooms. Um, if you've been in there, you notice that the, uh, the, the old restrooms were right out of the 1970s with the gold colors and the, uh, anyway, they were, they were long in need of an upgrade. So uh, cosmetic upgrade there and then as also as part of that there was no way to make those bathrooms uh, legal as far as uh, ADA accessibility so we're also converting a table closet into an ADA family rest uh, restroom so uh, partnering with the Rotary on that and we're about 50 percent through that project hoping to be wrapped up uh, by the end of February so it's going to be very very nice and that's uh, finishing up um, kind of a multi-year remodel project. 2018 into 19 was the kind of the main area and uh, 2020 was the kitchen and then this year is the restroom. So we're gonna have a beautiful building there if we ever can use it again, <laughs> so. Thank you, Nathan, I appreciate you doing that. Yep. Okay, and so that ends my report and we will move on to uh, public comments. Um, the public can uh, submit their questions or comments uh, via emails or letters. And um, if we receive them in time before the council meeting, we will read those, read them into the record. Um, I did not receive any that I know of. I didn't hear from Christine or even, so uh, Doug, do you know of any public comments that we no, may have received? I haven't received any. Okay. So um, I will try to open this up to the public right now. If there's anybody who would like to make public comment, I ask that you give your name and address and keep it to three minutes or less. It is 7.01. Is there anybody online who'd like to make public, com public comment? Okay, hearing none, I am going to close public comment and um, it is 7.02 and we will move on to Get, get going here with our business. First, we're gonna have a public hearing and this is on the Valley High Investments Incorporated annexation request. So at 7.02, I am opening up the public uh, hearing. Uh, 
for any comments anybody would like to make, again, your name, address, and keep it to three minutes. Is there anybody who would like to make public comment or pu make a public hearing? Okay, hearing none, I will close it at 7.03. And John, I will turn this over to you. Good evening again, Mayor and Council. So um, this is a this is a project that's been ongoing with the City Council and uh, Planning Department. So um, this is uh, the the latest step in an annexation request. If you can recall, back in October of 2020, well, the City Council held a meeting with the annexation uh, with the with somebody who was interested in having an annexation. Um, the, Council uh, determined that they would entertain a uh, annexation petition, and um, we received that signed annexation petition along with the legal description and um, and a map of the area. Uh, we received that on December twenty first, and then sent it uh, per state law to the Skagit County assessor for verification of the signatures. Um, and then we received from the Skagit County assessor a letter of determination stating that the, uh, that the petition is valid and meets state requirements for the number of signatures. So the next step is for the city council to hold a public hearing, which we just had the public hearing section portion of this to uh, uh, hear comments about this potential annexation. The map uh, is exhibit B, uh, in exhibit A of the ordinance, or uh, not ordinance, like, sorry, of the proposed resolution that you're being asked to pass today. It's a little hard to read, but uh, to see which exact parcels these are. It is um, 20.8 acres at the southwest corner of State Route 9, also known as Township Street, and at the intersection of Bassett Road. Um, the property is in the urban growth area, so it's perfectly uh, legitimate for it to be annexed. Um, and so this resolution that you're being asked to pass today was just stating that yes, the city council would be uh, would sign an ordinance in the future to annex this property. Uh, the The reason for this resolution, is, as opposed to just passing an ordinance now, is uh, this project also has to go to the boundary review board for their consideration. And um, one of their rules is that the city pass a resolution stating that yes, they would, they are, the city is interested in annexing this and uh, after it goes through the boundary review process, um, it'll come back to the city council for you to pass an ordinance. So for all intents and purposes, by passing this ordinance, you're saying yes to the, or to the annexation request, but the annexation request itself would not go into effect until you pass an actual ordinance at a latter date. I know that's a little confusing. Annexations have a long uh, process uh, governed by state rules. Um, they're not governed per se by city rules or even really Skagit County rules. It's uh, state legislation. Um, so I apologize for the wonky uh, pro procedures for this, um, uh, but I'm here to answer any questions and uh, give any assistance that I can. Staff does recommend that the annexation be accepted. So uh, we recommend passing the resolution that is included in the packet today. And there is a recommended action in the memo if you're looking for language uh, to make a motion. And that's all I have, unless there's any questions. I'm happy to go on more. All right. Yeah, this will be resolution 106121. Are there any are there any questions for John? Any comments at this point? Madam Mayor, Councilmember yes. Pesty, 
I, yes. I kind of have like a question slash statement on this. Um, I understand that our city has to grow and that growth is inevitable, but we have to start looking at the imprint these new developments are leaving on our town and in the schools. At this time, is it fair to flood the already busting at the same school with more children that this annexation would bring? So that's that's my concern right now. All right, thank you, Councilwoman Kesty. Any more questions or comments? Yes, um, I also have uh, questions and comments, please. Yes, Councilwoman Kinzer. I also am concerned about the schools. Um, most of, we're looking at probably, I don't know what, 70 homes up there at that zoning of R5, possibly 70, is that right, John? I'm, do, I'm doing the math as we speak because I don't have those notes in front of me, I apologize. Uh, there's probably about, you know, out of the 20 acres, six of it is uh, mixed commercial and then there's a creek in between that property and, you know, the developable area. So it's probably more along the lines of, I'd say, you know, 10 to 12 acres. So that'd be, you know, 50 to, uh, if you do 12, 12 times five would be 50 to 60 uh, units possible. Okay, so let's say maximum 60 units at 2.5 kids per home, which makes, um, what does that make, 150 kids? possibly impacting our school district. Um, how has this been addressed with the school district um, when Evergreen school, dis school Elementary School is already severely struggling at this point? We can't even allow the kids to drink the water at that school. Has this been addressed with the school district um, on how they're going to handle massive impact this is going to have on them and how is this also impacting our infrastructure regarding roads um utilities john liner road is already a really troublesome um intersection and i know we're talking about punching john liner road through the railroad grade um that will make a tremendous impact on it a tremendous improvement but I would like to know how all these things have already been addressed before we go ahead and improve this. We can't we can't um, approve something without knowing that all these additional impacts are already being looked at and addressed. That's my concern. Thank you. All right, good question. Um, I can answer part of it and John and anybody else, Mark, if you want to step in. So we do meet with the school on a regular basis. We meet with them once a month. They talk about the projects and or things of interest that the city might need to know about with us. And we also share with them what's happening, the projects that we have going on here within the city. So they're aware of the development that's happening. They're also aware of the road work that's taking place. Um, we do communicate with them on a regular basis and, you know, I, I hear your concern, but in all fairness, you know, it's the community that needs to, you know, pass those uh, levies and, 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 and. Um. So what are the school district's thoughts on how to handle this? If, if I, I, if I can answer, uh, answer. so um, all of the property that's been included in the urban growth area and, uh, it has been considered for its growth impact. That is, um, as part of the comprehensive planning process that the county and the city embark in, um, we do a 20 year population projection. So uh, we have studied the, the impacts of not only annexing you know, this little 20 acres, um, but also you know, what the future development impacts of that would be. So, we, um, as part of the comprehensive plan, we have the uh, land use element, which studies uh, exactly, um, we, we, that's where we have the 20 year projection of our population. Um, and then we set our urban growth areas based on how much land we're going to need to accommodate that projected growth over a 20 year period. So our 
our current uh, projections go out through, through 2036. And they assume that all of the property within the city is going to develop. So that includes all of the, uh, we did a study as part of this to see how much developable land exists in the city. And then we presume a full build out at its current zoning designations. We then look at how much area is in the urban growth area. And we uh, do an analysis of what uh, the, the maximum potential growth and population in that area would be. And these are all uh, then, you know, we, we size our urban growth area to make sure that we can accommodate our projected population growth, which I believe is about 4,555 people between 2016 and 2036. So not only do we look at the, you know, do, do we have enough land to accommodate uh, the projected population? We also study all of our concurrency uh, which mean, you know, concurrency is sort of a jargon word for um, transportation, utilities, and all of the other impacts of potential new growth. So we have studied the impact on the sewer system. Uh, the county actually required us to do an analysis of the, the sewer uh, plant and our uh, the sewer pipe infrastructure to make sure that um, the sewer does have uh, capacity and plans in place for expansion to accommodate our projected 20 year growth. So that was, that was done in 2016. In addition, uh, we study the, the number of people on how that will affect fire services. Um, that's partially uh, where our fire service or fire impact fees come from. And, um, as the school district is also a partner in this process. So the school district uh, being a partner knows exactly how many, uh, how many people are expected in the urban growth area and, the, and uh, over the next 20 years. Uh, they do their own capital facilities planning and they using their own numbers, they determine how many students are anticipated based on our population growth. From those numbers, they then determine what their capital facilities needs are. They study what schools need to be enhanced, whether or not they need new schools, whether or not they need to acquire additional land for schools. They also come up with a, based on those figures again, uh, uh, impact fees that are necessary to accommodate the growth that is reasonably caused by the new um, new population projections. So for every home that is built, re uh, every residential unit, whether it's an apartment or it's a, uh, or a single family dwelling, there is an impact fee. For a single family home, it's roughly $1,700 per unit. And for a, uh, a like a apartment unit, it's more like $900. And those are the numbers that the, the, the school district developed um, with these population projections in mind no, uh, that would help uh, defray the costs of new capital facilities that are necessary because of the growth. So the school district has studied uh, these issues. Um, our transportation plan has studied the transportation impacts um, the sewer capital facilities plan has studied the uh, population projections of, uh, for not just this growth, but all of our max projected growth over the next 20 years on our systems. And we're able to then, uh, you know, Mark, for example, creates uh, his list of transportation projects that are necessary to accommodate this growth. And that goes for you know, this is would be similar for any new uh, large subdivision. You know, we look at how many units are coming in and, and the impacts, but it's all it's all studied ahead of time as part of our population projections. Um, it's a very complex uh, process that we go through. Uh, I realize this is a very long-winded answer, and I 
barely scratched the surface of the amount of work that goes into studying the impacts of, uh, of potential growth. What you stumbled into is a question of, you know, that's what the planning department does. We really, uh, we, are, we are tasked with understanding what our potential uh, impacts of future growth are and making sure that the city not only accommodates it, but is, uh, it, it does so in a way that is good for the people that live in the city currently and makes for new development in the long range. John. Council Member Kesty, I, I'd like to say thank you because I do know how much work you guys put into everything that you do do. I guess my concern is that uh, the previous 10 years and where we are at now and where I am at within the school is not showing that we have prepared well enough because we're bursting out at the seams there. And so I guess that the, the the 10 year plan doesn't work for me because I'm living in it and so are my constituents and their children. So um, I still, still would have to look at this. Well, you know, the school district is the one that needs to you know, really address those issues. Um, you, the city does what we can to help. We collect impact fees and we assist in the studies. Um, we. I, I don't know if this runs into concerns with Nikki as far as you know if the city start uh, starts being saying no to potential development uh, because of schools. Um, I, I I don't know what sort of ramifications those have, but um, the the mechanisms are in place to uh, to put us in a place to success. Thank you, John. Yes, Are Mayor Johnson. Councilman oh, Allen. Yes, go oh, ahead. Add a couple of things. Uh, you know, I, I I know the sky is falling and stuff. You know, I don't think there's going to be 2.5 children per unit, but maybe there are. There's a lot of retired people that live in too. They're not all going to be going to the elementary school. Uh, part of it, uh, you know, we want infill in town on all vacant lots and we want to load it up here. Uh, you know, I, I think uh, John hit it and basically uh, council people Kinzer and Kesky hit it pretty well, but the school problems are the school problems as far as poor water or quality, you know, I, we can't control that other than we can collect the impact fees for them and you know how they spend that money is up to them but i think it would be in their court to uh increase the water quality uh my daughter thinks they should just rip evergreen down and build a new school on an empty field behind it and uh you know i mean it, Everybody's got opinions, but you know, the school problems shouldn't affect annexations, I don't think. Uh, we're not talking about a lot. Uh, we're talking about something that's gone through, a, going through a process very smoothly. It's been approved by the county. It's been approved by the planning commission. We gave them the go ahead to keep proceeding with it. Uh, I think it would be, bad on our part to pull out of this uh, of something that's been moving for the last four or five months. So anyway, that's my two cents worth. I agree with the concerns, but uh, you know, we can't control what the school district does. And, you know, that's their business. We can only maybe look at higher impact fees or I don't know if we can do it or the schools can. So anyway, I'm done now, okay? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman Allen. Councilwoman Kinzer, do you have another comment or question? Yeah, um, I still feel that the school issue really needs to be a part of our consideration, even though um, the school district does what the school district does, I still do not see a plan in place for the schools to accommodate 
that type of growth within the district as it is right now. The voters have already made their peace with um, providing additional money to build additional um, infrastructure within the school district. Yes, that was passed, but um, they, they said their piece at that time. And I also am not comfortable knowing that, that our infrastructure can keep up with this kind of growth up in that area. We're gonna see a tremendous impact on Highway 9 and the John Liner Road um, area right there. Um, I, I have not yet received enough information to feel confident with being comfortable with that kind of growth. It, doesn't feel good to me. I, I, I need more information to make me certain that we would be making the right decision by making by letting this pass. Okay, thank you, um, Councilman McGoffin. Hi, uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. I actually think uh, Kevin Lloyd had his hand raised uh, before I did. Um, either way is okay with me, though. I, I, I apologize, I didn't see it. I... Kevin, would you like to go first? Yeah, if you don't mind. I just had a quick question. I see there it says it, it's going to be a certain amount of areas going to be assigned com mixed commercial use. I don't see where it says how much of the area is going to be mixed commercial. And I don't, it, is it something that the city preset or is it something that's got to be discussed later? So it's about 6.5 acres of mixed commercial. And yes, it was uh, as part of the comprehensive planning when uh, the area was designated as, as urban growth area, the planning commission looked at uh, what uses would be um, beneficial in that area. And so they pre-designated it and we, we did all of our studies based on you know how much uh, residential and how much commercial land we had keep that all in balance. Um, and that's that 6.5 acres is the uh, area between the creek and the uh, and uh, township street. Um, so that was that was studied um, in the roughly started in 2014 and uh, finished up our work in 2016 on the urban growth area expansion back then. Um, and so as far as residents goes, um, we'll, using the 60 units possible over in that area in the R5 zone, the city uh, average population per unit is 2.59 persons per unit based on the, uh, the Office of Financial Management population estimates that they do annually. So that's how many people are in the average home in Cedro Woolley. Um, so if you multiply 60 times 2.59, that's about 155 people in that area. Um, so the, the, the number of students in that area, you know, as, assuming that it's a, you know, two persons per household, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, two, uh, two parents, uh, that would leave about 35 to 40, you know, very, very guesstimate kind of how many would be students that I don't know if that helps at all, um, but 2.59 persons per house is uh, 155 people based on the 60 units that would likely go in that, that full build out. That's all based on statistics. I don't believe that. So the, the mixed commercial is going to be 6.5 acres, and that's the maximum, is it? The mac, I'm sorry, the maximum? Of mixed commercial is going to be 6.5 acres. Yeah, that's a, that's already set. That That's a, an area that's already designated uh, as that. So that number, that 6.5 wouldn't change. Thank you. All right, Councilman McGoffin. 
All right, thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, John, I just had a question about the size of this development. Have we considered the parcel just south of uh, parcel 36414? Uh, I believe it's 36417. It's about 11 acre property that's also owned by Valley High Investments. Um, is that 60 unit number including the potential build out on that lot that's already part of the city? No, is, is that the one that's um behind the creek but behind uh the fire station too it's already in the city limits that's correct uh, yeah so uh no that doesn't include that process that that acreage that's already in the city so uh i just uh, i was just talking about the numbers of the um the new annexation proposal area okay is there a possibility that since those are next to each other that this new residential area would be a lot bigger than the 20 acres that we're looking at right now? Well, I suppose that would probably be reasonable. Um, so uh, that's a, so that would be another roughly 10 acres of developable land. So that'd be another you know 50 units possible. And um, so that would be a total of uh, times 2.59, uh, like 285 w residents would be the estimate in a 90 unit development. I'm sorry, the 110 unit development. Okay, thank you, John. John, I have another question. Joellen. Um, Go ahead, the, Kirsty. The, um, the commercial area is, was it, am I remembering correctly that it would be that they could also then put apartments above the uh, commercial bottom floor? So that is also potential for housing as well. Um, Yes, um, in the mixed commercial zone, if you have commercial below, you can put up to eight units per building above a uh, commercial space. Okay, thank you. Okay, are there other questions or comments? One more um, comment. Go ahead. I know our issue being city is not schools but I am seeing, according to my calculations, with the impact fee of $1,700 per unit times 60 units, that's $42,000 to go to our schools. How will that help? That's my question slash statement. That's, Thank you. That's an, that's an answer that, that we really can't provide, um, but it's- a I know it's not, it's not a city problem, but it's still a concern I have in my mind. Sure. sure. I have to. I, got, I have one more question, if I might. Go the, ahead. The way, read, the way I read it, it sounds like we're gonna have a public hearing later on about this. This is not the so-called official public hearing. This is the official public hearing. Oh, okay. Because yeah, was, some of the stuff I read made me believe that it was going to be later. So that's okay. That's the answer. There, Thank. You. There, there will be there there will be a public hearing uh, if a, if a resolution is passed. Uh, the the city council will still have the opportunity. Will still have to pass an ordinance at a latter date. Um, but this would maybe this is the time for the council to determine whether or not the, uh, you know, they're going to agree to an annexation. Because I know one of the questions in the, in the paperwork is fixing a date for the public hearing. So that kind of, that made me assume there's going to be a public hearing somewhere down the road. Um, most ordinance, uh, ordinances come with a public hearing, so there would be another public hearing. 
as part of the ordinance. Okay, uh, any more questions, comments? Okay, hearing none, I am wondering, is there a motion to pass resolution 106121 stating that the city's intent, the intent to annex the proposed 20.8 acres annex, annexation and improve the annexation petition to be forwarded to the Skagit County Boundary Review Board? Madam Mayor, uh, Councilman Allen. I make a motion. I make a motion to adopt 1061-21 ordinance. All right, thank you. Is there a second? Councilman McGoffin, um, I second. All right, thank you. So we have a motion by Councilman Allen, seconded by Councilman McGoffin for the approval of resolution 1061. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. And opposed, same sign. Opposed. Opposed. So I heard Councilwoman Kinzer, Councilwoman Kesty, and Councilman Owen. Is that correct? You're opposed? Yes. Opposed. Yes. yes. Okay. Uh, motion still carries. It's four to three. So, all right. Thank you, everyone. Good discussion. We are going to move on to the um, 2021 athletic field and RV park fee ordinance. Mr. Salcina, you are on. Good evening again, Mayor and Council. Uh, I'm going to run through this pretty quick again because I know Mark's got some stuff on the agenda. Um, so uh, once again, uh, this ordinance proposes to amend Cedarwood Municipal Code Section 12.36.020. Uh, it's an ordinance that we've been working on for about a year. We finally had a chance to get it before you. Uh, so changes that this ordinance uh, will put into effect. Um, the first item addresses RV park rates. Uh, currently, the rates are $25 at Riverfront Park per night and uh, $30 at Bingham. And uh, when we conducted a rate study in, at the beginning of 2020, uh, we found out that we were significantly under market for our service area for those, uh, for those rates. So this ordinance proposes to increase the rates at Riverfront to 35 and Bingham to 40. Um, the second item that the ordinance addresses is the length of stay at Riverfront Park. Uh, the current code states that the length of stay is to be no more than 15, uh, 14 consecutive nights and uh, this ordinance proposes to limit that to five consecutive nights. And uh, like I said at the last meeting, I'm proposing this because it's always been the intent of the facility to be for uh, short-term stays for citizens passing through town on the highways, fishing the river, or in town for a school reunion or picnic. Uh, the park just isn't set up for long-term stays because it lacks the sewer facilities and shower amenities that makes uh, long-term stays sanitary and feasible. Uh, the third item that the ordinance addresses is tent camping. Uh, the ordinance removes the provision for tent camping uh, pretty much for the same reasons as the, as the uh, RV, the length of stay at the RV. We're just not set up for the uh, uh, facilities. So, and uh, the fourth and probably the largest items that the ordinance does is create a rate structure for field usage fees. Uh, for our athletic facilities. And this is a new one for Cedar Woolley as we've never charged for field usage before. Uh, so these new fees will help us to hire an additional five month seasonal position to assist with field maintenance during the spring and summer months. And uh, work very closely with the different user groups over the past year to come up with a rate schedule that works for the groups. And uh, also in your packet is the field usage policy that we've developed in partnership with the different users to uh, uh, help us administer this policy. So uh, it's on for a second read and we're hoping for uh, action tonight. Happy to entertain questions. All right, thank you, Nathan. Are there any questions for Nathan? I got one question now. Is you, you're gonna keep the maintenance on the fields up. You don't line them or anything, but you're gonna do the mowing and stuff like that. Yeah, so it goes into pretty good detail uh, in the in the policy as to what we do, and 
it, it, it's kind of a hybrid policy. We don't want to take on everything down there. We want to leave some of that stuff to the different user groups like field lining and taking care of the bases and stuff. So basically what we've committed to is, you know, trash pickup, caring for the turf, take, uh, taking care of the infield dirt, uh, things like that. But yeah, if, if you look at the section seven of the, of the policy, it, it goes into some pretty good detail in there as to what, what the city will do and what we still expect the user groups to do. And we've, we've adjusted the fees accordingly. Like you'll, if, if you go and look at user fees, like over in Burlington, you'll notice that ours are quite a bit lower because we just don't have the staff to provide the service that Burlington does, so. Well, I know a little bit about baseball, baseball fields. And first thing I wanna say is the, uh, one thing to remember is Cedar Woolley schools, they have the high, you know, astronomical numbers for free lunches, which tells you people don't have a lot of money. But, but looking at your numbers for baseball fields, the most expensive one you have looks like it, if, if you do it weekly, it's $12, $13 a month or $13 per day to use it. So, the, I mean, you can't ask for a better deal than that. So I don't know anything about soccer fields, but baseball fields, that's not bad at all. Yeah, we worked really hard to try to make it, uh, you know, get get us what we needed to do the, to provide the service, but keep it as low cost as possible for the folks. So, because that's a big deal, you know, because there's a lot of low income people in Cedar Woolley, so a lot of people miss out because they just don't have that money. Right. All right. Thank you. Any other Nathan, questions or comments? Yeah, Nathan, Allen. Allen. Uh, Basically, the the fees we're going to collect would just pay for a five month part time person to help maintain the field. I mean, we're adding parks and fields all the time, and obviously, we need uh, a person out there maintaining it. So, would pretty much the fees go towards uh, the extra uh, part time employee? Exactly. That that's the intent of what we're trying to do. Uh, it would just be basically a pass through. They pay the fee, and we, we we would pay directly for the for the staff person. Yep. Right, uh, Councilman DeYoung. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you, Spending some time looking at Um and. That's the last sentence. So we're you're proposing eliminating the tent. Don't have adequate power facilities and unsanitary conditions. Um, did a little research and was looking at federal, state, county, and other cities' requirements for shower facilities in their tent uh, camping areas. And I I was wondering, where would we have that? Um, and then secondly, um, how many incident reports do we have on unsanitary conditions uh, at the park based on those campers? Thank you. Sorry, uh, sorry, Carl, I'm having some connectivity issues. I, I heard- uh, <laughs> I hate that part, Nathan. I, I, you were kind of cutting in and out there. I, I only heard about- Yeah, lag sucks. <laughs> I only heard about half of what you asked, but I heard a question about, sounded like you said, why uh, can we keep the, or can you repeat that? I'm sorry. Yeah, uh, it boils down to two things. Is uh, what, do we have any ordinances uh, that are being violated when, when people uh, use the sink to, to splash, uh, to freshen up? And secondly, uh, how many instances of un unsanitary conditions based on people doing that? Uh, well, the answer to the first question is, is I, I don't think that there's any city ordinances okay. uh, that, that violates. Uh, I can't speak as to the, the health department code. I'd have to do some research and get back with you. But, um, you know, it's I would say maybe you can count on one hand the time it happens, you know, maybe five, six times during the summer months. So it's... Uh, it's regular enough to be an annoyance, but it's not terrible at this point, so. Thank you. Okay. If there are no other questions or 
Madam Mayor, I, I would like a third reading on this so we can have our staff uh, bird dog down those answers. Um, I, is there urgency on this for the second reading to pass it? Uh, I didn't hear that part. And if, if I miss it, I apologize. Uh, no, I, I don't believe so. We could probably bring it back again. Um, our budget is already built uh, based on the fact that we weren't we weren't planning on receiving any of this money this year anyway. So, um, and the RV park is the only one that would be time sensitive, and we don't plan on opening that at Riverfront until um, April first. So we've we've got about a month before we really got to got to do anything. So, yeah, I just want to reemphasize. I really appreciate all the work that's been put into this and all the research that 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 uh, has gone into this. And uh, I, I just would like to know more about the sanitary conditions that. I've been closing uh, those tent uh, spots. Thank you very much. Yeah. Is the rest of the council in agreement uh, for a third read? Yes, definitely. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Okay, we'll do that then. All right, thank you, we'll bring it back. Moving on to the agreement with BNSF, Mark Freiberger, you're on. Thank you, Mayor. I'm gonna to try to share, share my screen here and uh, show you some pictures. Can you see this? Um, vicinity yes. map for the yeah. Thank you. So council, uh, tonight, um, I'm not here to do exactly what I intended to, but I wanted to use the time to give you the background information for this proposed agreement. Um, BNSF, uh, we've been working with them for several months to get an agreement in place to uh, uh, provide for the actual construction of the BNSF undercrossing uh, that would connect Jones Road and John Liner Road at SAP. And uh, unfortunately, they haven't gotten me a draft agreement yet. Uh, they, it was due last Wednesday, and I've been communicating with them daily. We actually, through our uh, mutual consultant, Russ Widener, had to put some pressure on the local BNSF uh, contract staff from their executive vice president out of Texas, which he did do uh, because they are very interested uh, at the higher level to make this project happen. Uh, and so they are uh, working on it now pretty quickly, but I didn't have it for tonight. But I wanted to go ahead and give you the background on this. I actually think this will be uh, somewhat useful for council, especially for the newer members in uh, looking what uh, what the transportation improvements uh, planned in the city are to deal with the growth that we see in the comprehensive plan over the next uh, 20 years. So this overview map shows the uh, Jones John Liner Trail Road Corridor project. As you as you have, that have been around for a while know, we've been working on uh, a plan to provide a, an alternative east-west arterial in the city. Uh, well, actually the plan precedes myself, so it's been going on for 15 or 16 years at least. This has been in our comprehensive plan uh, since that time. We did a major uh, relook at it in 2016 when we, we worked with John to update the transportation element. And then we engaged uh, Reichardt and Evie, one of our uh, area consultants, to do an actual corridor study, which was completed in the uh, spring of 2020. Well, we all know what's happened since then, so you haven't uh, seen much of that study other than uh, my periodic reports and uh, the preparation of our six-year transportation improvement program, which I am required uh, to do on an annual basis. Uh, our TIP uh, reflects uh, the priority of these projects that have been identified in our scoping study plan. And these actually are the main projects that you will see coming before you for the next six to 10 years. Uh, this is a series of, of eight separate projects, uh, which we have uh, put together to uh, do just what I mentioned earlier, and that's provide an alternative east-west arterial. Uh, we were uh, successful in uh, providing a, a, an east-west arterial on the south side of town when we built the Jameson uh, roundabout and the extension across the old uh, lumber uh, company uh, yard down there to connect to Jameson Street. Jameson has been an arterial basically for many, many decades. Uh, this makes it a much more, that made it much more usable one and it's working as intended. 
Uh, this will provide a similar uh, way to take some of the pressure off of the state route uh, on the north side of town. The major impediment to doing this, of course, is the uh, existence of the BNSF Sumas line, uh, which uh, comes from uh, the east, from Burlington, along the south side of Highway 20. This is Highway 20 through town, where my cursor is. It follows uh, uh, SR 20 and then uh, travels uh, south and then east of the uh, Skagit uh, complex, uh, the Sealand uh, buildings there, and then crosses Highway 20 at the Timber Trestle that you're all very familiar with on Highway 20. And it's increasing in altitude by embankment as you go north. When we get to the crossing uh, at Sap Road, which is a single lane timber structure, I'll show you a picture of in a second. It's uh, roughly uh, almost 30 feet in the air. Uh, our project would provide a new BNSF undercrossing at this location that I'm pointing out here that's roughly 22 feet in the air. Um, so that's that's the subject of the agreement we're working on. I just want to speak a little bit more about this map. The corridor basically starts uh, at Highway 9 on the east. Uh, you may recall we applied for TIB grant funds last year uh, to rebuild that intersection. That was one of the comments made by Council Member Kenzer, the challenges that intersection already has during the peak hours. And so that was our first try at that, uh, and we ranked okay. Uh, we didn't uh, get funded, but uh, it will be funded at some point. I'm very confident of that. Our time just wasn't yet. Uh, it will go from that point along the existing John Liner Road uh, to Reed Street, and then on existing right of way that's unopened from Reed Street over to the embankment. Uh, we would have a rail crossing at that location and then connect to Jones Road and then run on Jones Road on existing city right of way uh, down to intersect Epson S grade road. That completes an east-west uh, route, but it doesn't get the predominance of the traffic that will want to route back to either Cook Road or uh, SR 20. So we have two ways of doing that. Uh, the first one is a, uh, a short uh, cut, so to speak, that would utilize uh, the Rimmer property, the undeveloped property that runs between Jones Road and SR20 on the west side, or yes, the west side of, of Sap Road and the railroad embankment. Uh, this is an extension of the uh, roundabout that is at Patrick Street currently, and, and it is the reason, by the way, that roundabout was built back in 2008. Uh, we were looking forward to this particular extension at that time. Uh, due to the 2008 recession and the retirement of the Rimmer brothers and basic lack of interest to move forward other than to sell this, it's pretty much set since. Uh, but this project would extend that street uh, from the, the Michael Street, which goes to the food bank up to Jones Road. That would provide uh, a route for some traffic that's coming down Highway 9 in the morning that wants to travel, but that currently has to go through our busy intersection at Townstrip Street and 20, and then combined with all the other traffic on SR 20 uh, around town to either go to Cook Road and I-5 or SR 20 and Burlington and I-5, that direction. So uh, that's the first way. The second way is on a new route uh, that doesn't exist that would travel from East Jones Road through what uh, uh, it, it was a vacant uh, parcel of land, uh, but is now under construction as Garden Meadows subdivision uh, down to FNS Grade Road, and then on another section uh, through uh, the uh, uh, small uh, parcels that are uh, fronting FNS Grade Road and down uh, through this large track, which is owned by the Bucko Family Trust, and then back down to Cook Road in the vicinity of Trail Road with a new intersection at that location. I'll speak a little bit more about this later uh, in, in uh, our talk. Um, the focus of this particular part though is uh, the undercrossing itself. I think I mentioned before, but the absolute key to the, su the success of this corridor is that undercrossing. We have been working very hard uh, 
through a lot of different means, including legislative outreach. And Carl was involved in our meetings last year, and I've been, I've been doing that for three years now, uh, presenting legislature, in an attempt to fund uh, the brass ring, the entire project. Uh, the estimate coming out of the scoping study when I first started this effort was $30.6 million. Uh, when we finished the study in uh, March of, or January of last year, uh, the price tag had gone up somewhat uh, to about 34 million. Uh, through the fact that some of this work, uh, we've looked at doing different things than we originally planned, like for instance, instead of a roundabout, which was in the, uh, the final scoping study ex uh, estimate at nine and highway, uh, highway nine and, and McGarrigal, uh, we're looking at that as a signalized intersections for a lot of reasons, including safety for the school children crossing at that location. So that's kind of a, a, a five minute overview of the whole corridor project. I will be talking a lot more about this in, in coming months. Um, what we're doing currently, uh, we're preparing to submit another round of applications to our legislative delegation in, in Olympia. Uh, those are due uh, in draft form on the 12th of February. So. If you're looking for me between now and then, uh, I'll be in here with the door closed and the smoke coming out of all the very available vents. Um, so the good things that have happened uh, to the project so far is, as I mentioned, there is a development that is building this section of the road for us, donating and, and, um, and building that for us. That's underway right now. That won't, that won't build uh, major intersection improvements. We also plan at Jones and uh, F and S grade, but it takes care of the bulk of that and it sets the location that we have to hit on F and S grade road. This green line is kind of the first cut at how this would go through the Bucko property and these intervening uh, parcels on F and S. And our original look at this, um, which I'll talk about in some detail later on in executive session, uh, was to go through the school district property and tie back uh, there. So enough said for all of that. We've got a lot of stuff coming up on that. You'll hear from us uh, at the next council session about uh, those grant applications. Uh, we are not proposing any matching funds for that. Uh, we really don't have enough to match a $30.6 million thing. So that's, that's an ask for the whole banana at one shot. And uh, we just got word today that our project is included in uh, Senator Hobbs's version of his transportation package, which he's seeking to fund uh, in this legislative session. Uh, and so that's good news. Uh, that's, that's what uh, we've been working for for a number of years. That could result in this whole project being funded at one shop, which is actually ideal. The reason you see it in all these multicolors on here is that the reality is, is it's not likely to be built in one shot. It's likely to take place in pieces. So uh, we'll be looking to fund everything that we can uh, through other grants. For instance, the signal that I mentioned earlier at, at McGarrigal Road. Okay, so I will be bringing to you, uh, hopefully at the next time we meet, and it may even have to be a special session, uh, the actual uh, rails agreement with uh, DOT uh, to, uh, I mean, excuse, excuse me, with BNSF to uh, get this thing uh, actually constructed. The funds that we have from legislature are to be spent by June 30th. So we're running really short on time, but we do have BNSF working actively on the design. And I actually expect to see their final designs on uh, Friday of this week with a confirming estimate for what the cost is for them to do that. I have a couple other pictures. And uh, this is a picture of the existing wooden trestle. I'm sure many of you have been through this. This is a dangerous location. It's, it's a single lane. It's a hairpin turn on the, on the east side. Uh, there has been a fa fatal accident at this intersection in the last five years. Uh, school buses use this a couple of times a day. Uh, they have to stop, beep the horn like everybody else does and hope nobody's pulling around the corner because if they get stuck in here, it's kind of difficult for them to move or maneuver out as I found out from a personal experience with one of their buses that you see in this picture. So anyway, that's, that's the need at this location. Included in the agreement, uh, which uh, this agreement will actually be the first of two, is uh, the city's commitment to close this existing roadway and to pay BNSF to basically either 
fill this in using the dirt from the other uh, location that we're digging out or to, to build a, st a structure that just spans the creek and then fill in the part where the roadway is. That's a subsequent project. Uh, you can see this estimate on this page is about 9.8 million for the total project. What we've got right now is $850,000. But that's the vital first element and that keeps BNSF cooperating with the city to make uh, this essential prop, uh, project happen. Uh, the next picture is kind of an overview of what I just showed you in the photo. Uh, this is the new crossing connecting Jones Road and John Reiner, Liner. This is existing Sap Road crossing that trestle that you just saw. Uh, this particular picture was uh, the estimate we have in the scoping study that you just saw anticipates putting a box culvert in and then filling this with the dirt that comes out of this. That's still our preferred way. BNSF is still thinking about how they want to handle this. Uh, we should have that resolved in the next month or two. Uh, these are the preliminary drawings that uh, we have provided to BNSF that they're working on on the actual rail design. Um, this is a section view. Uh, this is our preferred option. Uh, it is a three span structure uh, with the roadway in the middle, uh, a uh, five foot sidewalk on one side of the uh, first pier and then an eight foot shared use path on the other side that's gonna to connect to the existing system. We already have basically all the way from McGarrigal now, right now to uh, uh, highway, highway Nine Township Street. This would extend that shared use path uh, throughout the other parts I showed on the multi-colored map and then tie it back down to Cook Road via the trail road option, basically a sidewalk one side and a shared use path on the other side. Um, that's basically all I wanted to show you tonight. Again, I'll bring that back to you in a subsequent meeting, uh, but it gives you a little uh, overview of what all we're doing uh, and what you'll be seeing from me over the next few weeks, putting together that package for the legislature uh, to consider this. And again, this, this corridor project is uh, our main priority uh, over the next number of years. So you're gonna be seeing this, you're gonna hear, it, hear more from me you want to than you want to on it, but it's really big stuff for the city. Uh, it does answer the problems transportation wise uh, that were discussed earlier tonight. So that was a perfect segue into what we're doing here. I'll come back at a subsequent meeting uh, because of uh, the several new members on council and give you a detailed briefing on this, on the scoping study and all of the pieces and parts and all of the information that you want to have. But this is, this is a, a pretty good introduction to that, I think. So no action required tonight, that'll come back to you uh, later on. Now I wanna say that in our discussions with BNSF, uh, one of the other things that's turned up uh, on this and, and also being driven by what we're gonna talk about at executive session tonight is a need to move forward with some other preparatory things uh, on this project. One of which is doing the environmental study uh, in particular uh, for uh, the larger project uh, that, that will in the future connect the roadway from Reed Street to uh, SAP and uh, will decommission the existing crossing. We need to do some work on that to be ready uh, for uh, whatever opportunities come up in grants. If we happen to pull the brass ring and legislature full, funds the full thing, uh, we won't need to do that. Uh, but barring that, it's gonna be really important that we put ourselves in position to uh, have a good shot at uh, the various grant opportunities that we expect to happen. And there's basically three things I know about in, a, in addition to the legislature uh, right now. Uh, the first one being our old standby transportation improvement board. I submit at least two applications to that yearly and we've had some pretty good success here in Cedar Woolley. Most of the system of uh, center turn lane and, and the shared use path and the sidewalk on highway 20 and then the project that we just did to assist the uh, county with the behavioral health center out near life care, they're all TIB uh, funded projects, at least partially, some of them solely so. Uh, so that's one. Uh, the second one is through our council of governments, we have uh, opportunity to uh, get grants for that up to a couple of million dollars. TIB in our area will fund up to 3 million. We've had a $4 million project when we built the two roundabouts on Cook Road. 
So neither one of those is big enough to fund that $9 million project that would do what I'm showing here. So it's gonna take, it's going to take some uh, schmoozing, uh, some putting projects together and having things in position is gonna be really, really important uh, on that. And so I'll be bringing to you uh, my ideas on how we can do the environmental part of this uh, in the next weeks and doing some preliminary engineering to support that. The scoping study did most of what I wanted for that. It provided the estimates, it provided the routes, it provided some, some order of magnitude right-of-way estimates, but we need to get a little more detailed uh, to get ourselves into position for that kind of funding. So Mayor, I think that's enough said about this and I'll shut up until the executive session. All right, thank you, Mark. Thank you for the presentation. It's good to keep everybody in the, in the know. As he said, it's all been happening this past week. So I see it's after eight o'clock and if there are no objections, I am going to um, ask that we just move forward and finish out the agenda that we have tonight. We do have an executive session and we do have another presentation. So any objections? Okay, hearing none, we will move forward. So- uh, Madam, Madam Mayor, I believe we have to set the time of how long you wanna do that. 8.30, we'll be out of here by 8.30 hopefully. Nikki. So I, I agree with the half hour extension. Thank you. Were you ready for me to start, Mayor? Oh, yes. Thank you, Nikki. Oh, oh thank you, Mayor. So this evening I have um, a first read on Ordinance 1977 21, which, um, if passed, will amend the Cedro Woolley Municipal Code to add a new chapter 12.45 entitled filming permits. Um, this particular ordinance has come about because there have actually been an increase in the number of requests for commercial um, film permits. And the city doesn't exactly have a vehicle um, currently in place to uh, efficiently allow that. The city has used special event permits, but that isn't exactly the right type of permit to use um, for these purposes. So there are other jurisdictions that have filming permit codes. And so we took a look at those and um, put together this ordinance that would um, put in place parameters for issuing film permits. Um, I'm sure that you've had the opportunity to review the ordinance. And so I won't go into a great deal of um, detail um, unless you have any questions. This is just a first read. Um, there is at least one thing in the ordinance that is going to need to be fixed, and that is the issue of um, fees. Currently, I have that the fees would be pursuant to a master fee schedule adopted by resolution of the council. And since Cedra Woolley doesn't have a master fee schedule, um, we've been discussing internally, um, perhaps starting to move towards a master fee schedule and, and starting maybe with a finance department fee schedule. Um, citizens and, and departments alike tend to prefer fee schedules because all of the information about fees and costs are all in one place. So um, we're talking internally about how to incorporate a fee for this and where the most appropriate location for that might be. Um, other than that, it is a first read and I'll stand for questions if you have any. If not, you can expect to see this back at a subsequent council meeting. So are there any questions, any uh, comments for Nikki? Councilman DeYoung? Yes, thank you. Fantastic. Thanks for putting this in. Carl, you're, you're not, you're cutting out. Okay, I can't help that. Um, I really agree with the second. Uh, we can't. Fantastic. I have questions uh, about the different stratum when we get into filming uh, versus, you know, uh, an influencer trying to do a YouTube thing um, to, you know, a full blown uh, Hollywood feature film. Uh, I think those are, are different stratums for fee structures, and I know you're working on that. Uh, at some point, uh, Things like uh, we see uh, in it, as we see in New Mexico, where there are provisions within the city that something of a certain scale that there's a local higher. You know, 
this is great stuff. Uh, looking forward to it evolving. Uh, thank you. I think, right, thank I, you. Caught, I think I caught most of that. And um, I'm, I, I am glad that uh, there is support for this. It's exciting because um, what I understand is that production companies look for jurisdictions that have these types of provisions in their code and it does put heads in beds. And so from an economic development perspective, um, there, I think there's value to it. All right, thank you. Um, anyone else? All okay. right, I will bring it back at a future date. Thank you, Nikki. You're welcome. Okay, uh, now we are gonna move into executive session and this is to consider the acquisition of real estate where public knowledge of consideration would cause a likelihood of increased price under RCW 4230-110-1B. Um, we'll take 10 minutes and uh, it is 8.08, so we'll be back at
So the conversation that we are having in executive session um, needs to be extended in order for all the information to be shared properly. So um, we are gonna um, be out for another 10 minutes um, under RCW 4230-1101B. Thank you.
Are you there, Bill? <clears throat> what happened to it? I got cut off. I don't huh? know. I don't know. Bill. I don't know. I got cut off somehow. You got cut off? Yeah. How'd that happen? Don't know. Bill. Can you call Kevin or something? I don't know.
Okay, it looks like everybody is here. So um, I will bring us back to order here. If there is anything for the good of the order, no action was taken by the way in our executive session. And so if there's anything for, anything for the good of the order, if not, we are adjourned. Thank you, everyone. Bye, everybody.